So um, thanks everyone for making it out today. Um, today we have Hua Huang from uh, Georgia Southern University, and he'll be telling us about coloring, tilings, and counting compositions. So please take us away. All right, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, always good to visit South Carolina, even if it's just virtually. Um, so I chose this topic well, one of the reasons is just that it's hard to find new things to talk about since there are so many people here who has heard my talk many times. Uh, so this is relatively new. And another major reason is that my collaborator, uh, Brian Hopkins, uh, made most of the slides already. So I figure he did such a great job. So I'll just use it. Uh, so if you see anything you really like, it's probably from him. Uh, all right, so let's see. All right, so an integer composition of a number n is an ordered sum of positive integers. So this n is also most of time, well, also always uh, a positive integer. And, uh, and the, the keywords being ordered, so that's what separate, separates uh, this from partitions. Uh, so for example, if you look at all the compositions of the number three, you can have a single three or two plus one or one plus two or one plus one plus one. The order matters, which is why uh, two plus one, and one plus two are different. Uh, and we use this capital C of three to denote the total number of compositions of n, in this case, n equals three. Uh, the reason that we use the mu instead of n is because for technical reason, we have to uh, use n in the terminology of something else. And uh, in the past, some people really don't like us using n for different things. So new here, uh, but I'm still tempted to say n all the time. Uh, all right, now um, for the majority of this talk, actually for most of, for almost all of this talk, we will be interested in uh, looking at the tiling representation of a composition. And uh, this is to say that if you are looking at the compositions of the integer three, we take a one by three board here. Uh, and then for each tile, uh, it corresponds to the, the, the size of the part, right? So here, if you have two plus one here, we have a one by two board, a two tile and a one by one tile. Uh, so this is a very straightforward way of representing uh, integer compositions. And uh, well, there's there's nothing difficult about it, um, but it's interesting that how many combinatorial insights one can gain using this tiling representation. Uh, for instance, uh, among well many other things that one probably already know about compositions, we know that the total number of compositions is a power of two. Uh, and uh, when you look at the tiling representation of a composition, you look at this big board here. And within this big board, there are, uh, well, within this big board of size one by n, uh, you have n minus one invisible vertical little lines here separating the square cells, right? And uh, when you look at the tiling representation of this composition, each of these little vertical lines could either be a join connecting two cells into a joint bigger part or a cut separating part from part, right? And uh, among this n minus one little lines, each one could be either a join or a cut, giving you uh, two to the n minus one choices. And of course, uh, if you are looking for the number of compositions with specific number of parts, that is to say that you have specific number of cuts here, right? Now all that matters is out of this n minus one invisible lines, which k minus one of them to be cut, uh, to be cuts, which give you k parts. So uh, that gives the number of compositions with specific number of parts. Uh, among many other interesting things about compositions, uh, there are these few that's related to uh, Fibonacci numbers. Um, and uh, I'll take this opportunity to introduce this notation here. C with bracket one, two denotes the number of compositions with parts one and two. So here, this means the number of compositions with no part of size one. 
This one means number of compositions with only odd parts. Okay. So we're not going to prove all this. Uh, just one of them, uh, I guess, to illustrate uh, the basic ideas of this kind of combinatorial arguments. So we'll take the last one here, where we consider compositions with only odd parts. Uh, so if n equals one, you have just one case, uh, one possibility. One n equals two, still one, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Uh, and we want to show that the number of possibilities is uh, Fibonacci numbers. And as you can see, one, one, two, three, five, so far so good. Uh, and once when you move on to the next level, uh, six, uh, this is one n equals, just kidding. This is one uh, n equals four and five, and this is one n equals six. So all we have to do is to show that it actually satisfies the uh, same recursion as the Fibonacci numbers. So we take the number of uh, compositions with only odd parts of, uh, of four and of five, and we do the following. So if it was a five, we just add a square at the end, very simple. Uh, and you get a composition of six with still only odd parts because we added a part of size one. And, uh, and it ends with a part of size one. And if it was a part, uh, a composition of four, you just uh, expand the last part, which was odd, uh, but expand it by two more. So one became three, three became five, so on and so forth. And that gives you a composition with only odd parts of, uh, of six, but this time it ends with a part that is at least three. Um, so that's a simple example of how one can use this uh, piling representation to prove interesting identities uh, of compositions. Um, so what we are interested in is uh, n color compositions. And uh, this is where we use n uh, four. And uh, so the official definition says that each part of size n has n colors. Uh, so now if you look at compositions of three now, so uh, for the composition of three, originally we had just one three, right? But now that this part of size three has three different colors uh, denoted by subgroups. So we have three sub one, sub two, sub three, right? And then for the composition two plus one, uh, this one only has one choice because it's of size one, but this two has two possibilities now. So we have two sub one, two sub two, so on and so forth. So now the number of n color compositions of three is uh, eight. Yeah, if I can count right. Um, all right. So, and again, uh, so this has been the topic of some research work in the in the recent years. But what we're interested in is how piling representation uh, fits in there. And uh, so this is a very clever way of representing n color compositions with tilings, where I just put a dot in each tile. And the position of this dot represents the color, right? So because this tile of size three has three possibility, uh, possible positions for the dot, that corresponds to the three different colors, right? So sub one, sub two, sub three corresponds to the location of the dot at the first, second, or third cell of this tile, uh, similar for the other others. So this was introduced by uh, Hopkins. Um, and uh, we're happy to report that every single thing presented in this uh, talk can be proved using this representation. So which made him pretty excited, I believe. <clears throat> All right, um, so first as an example, uh, uh, the number of n color compositions, right, so is every other Fibonacci number. So it's not, uh, not the power of Q, even though we had an A before, uh, but it's not the power of Q, but just uh, every other Fibonacci numbers. And there is a very, so this was first proved through, I believe, generating functions. Uh, when it was introduced. Um, but with spotted tiling, you have this very neat proof where you take all the spotted tiling representations of the n color compositions, and then you expand it to twice as large. Okay, so imagine that you take this and you pull it horizontally so that it's twice as wide as before. 
uh, and then for every single solid line that separate separate parts and for every dot we turn that into a solid line here um, so in this particular example this one which was originally at the second location right but after it was expanded twice as large it went there uh, and then this dot which was originally at one half location right because it was in the middle of the first cell now after expanded to twice as large it was at the first partition and this one comes from uh, that dot right there um, so you can see that uh, the resulted composition regular composition no color involved uh, must have only uh, all the parts because the because there has to be a line between our two dots right so the parts in this new composition is defined by these lines which came from a dot and a line in here which is always a half integer which gives you an odd number uh, after it was doubled uh, so that gives you all the compositions regular compositions with only odd parts which we have actually just proved that is a uh, fitness number right and of course the uh, these compositions are only of even numbers there go every other Fibonacci numbers so um, this is this proof is not by me or anything, but uh, I just think it's really nice. All right, uh, among other things, um, recursion has been studied for the n color compositions, and this is uh, well, this is a rep one of the representative results where you can represent the number of n color compositions as well a linear combination of the previous ones. Um, and this was proved in a very well, much more complicated, but very similar way as what we did before. Um, we basically use a bijection to show that the disjoint union of n color compositions of n and n color compositions of n minus four uh, has a one-to-one -one map to the n color composition of these guys. And it's all uh, through adding apart, expanding apart, these sort of very elementary uh, operations. So it's not necessarily short, but uh, but but it's uh, but nothing complicated was involved. Uh, all right. Now there are other works about n color compositions and uh, compositions enumerations in general, and most of the work so far seems to be focusing on you know the number of compositions, number of compositions allowing odd parts or not allowing certain parts, and so forth. Uh, so it's all about restricting part sizes, but not colors. Uh, so what we wanted to do in the, uh, well, wanted to look at in the rest of this talk is to look at uh, n color compositions with restricted colors. So not part sizes, but colors, okay? Um, so, you know, you can list the number of theoretical uh, motivations for Studying this, uh, but of course, also it's just interesting uh, to look at uh, elementary combinatorial proofs. Um, so we can formulate the 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 I don't really want to call it main results, but uh, the 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 fundamental results uh, as the following three. So if you allow colors. C1, C2, so on and so forth. So, and a collection, a finite collection of colors are allowed, only they are allowed. Then we have this recursion of the number of n color compositions. And if a finite collection of colors are forbidden, then we have this recursion. And if the number of, I'm sorry, and if uh, we do allow infinitely many and forbidden, forbid infinitely many colors at the same time, in other words, uh, but, but the colors have to satisfy some modular condition, then, uh, then we have this recursion. So we're not actually going to prove any of this today, but uh, just know that they are all proved through elementary approaches, through bijections. Uh, but since some of them involve infinitely many uh, cases, so, um, some manipulation is needed, but they are all based on 
the spot dividing representation of n color combinations. So of course, once you get this recursion, you can generate a sequence and can do uh, quite a few different fun things. In particular, you can pretty much just generate sequences uh, for whatever you want, right? We can allow one particular color, two colors, consecutive colors, so on and so forth, or forbid, forbid whatever choices of colors or modulo uh, cases. Uh, and uh, in this line of work, a lot of times, once we find out a way, whether it is through generating function or recursion, to generate the sequences, we actually punch it into this thing called Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, OEIS, and see, uh, see what other people say about this sequence. And a lot of times, they count all sorts of weird things, and uh, we like finding uh, connections between them. And that's exactly what we did with this, uh, this recursions. So we can generate all this. And uh, in the rest of this talk, I picked uh, a few special cases where we found some other interesting objects that appear to be counted by the same sequence or have direct formulas and so forth. And we try to explain their connection through this spot dividing uh, representation. Um, so these are just some of the many cases that one can look at. Um, I think I picked them mainly because we have nice pictures ready, uh, so I don't have to draw them. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so the first case is when you only allow colors one and two, and uh, the recursion comes from our theorem. Um, and it turns out that there is a bijection between these n color compositions, allowing only colors one and two to ternary words. Um, so with lengths one less, so n minus one ternary words, um, but avoid zero two and two zero. Uh, this bijection is actually very easy to do. Uh, so if you look at the, the spotted tiling representation of an n color composition here. And you look at all the cuts in this representation and we turn that into a one. And we look at all the joins in this representation. If it is in a tile where the color is two, we label it as two. If it is in a tile where the color is one, we label it as zero, okay? So, uh, absolutely nothing fancy is involved here. And uh, the point is that any two and zero must be separated by a one, right? So within each tile, you either have all zero or two. To get from zero to two or two to zero, you have to have a one, maybe more than one one, that's okay. Uh, but that gives you the ternary words of lengths, same number of as this invisible little vertical lines and uh, avoiding uh, zero, two and two zero. So quite simple. Uh, still about n color compositions allowing only colors one and two, there is a direct formula. And we found out that we can generate this, uh, I mean, generalize this uh, direct formula um, to allowing not just colors one, to one and two, but colors one, two, all the way up to C. Now, I wasn't sure if I should show this, but, uh, but this is a formula, okay? Uh, so there is that. And uh, in there, this thing is defined recursively that way. Um, so I don't think it's super exciting to come up with a formula this complicated. Um, but I guess what, uh, what was interesting to us is that um, the way to explain these formulas comes directly from how you uh, build up this n color compositions. So I'll just try to explain a little bit of it, uh, not everything. Uh, so this is the original formula, the number of n color compositions allowing only colors one through C, right? And uh, so what we do is we look at um, the number of cells in the tiling representation that was after the spot. So Let's say that if you have a tile like this and uh, the spot is here, 
who are looking at all these files, right? And then uh, there are this many of them uh, distributed over this many parts. Okay, so there are this many ways to distribute those cells. And then we just say, okay, so the number of ways to allocate the remaining uh, 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 parts is that. And that in turn is uh, recursively defined uh, like, like this. So where each of this is just a number of ways to uh, to allocate empty squares in, in blocks of certain total size that allows colors up to a certain point. Okay. Um, so that's how this was built up. Uh, again, the formula itself wasn't that exciting, but we were happy that it can be explained combinatorially, even though I'm not sure how well I explained that just now. Um, all right. Okay. So another interesting case I promised was uh, when you do not allow color too. Um, and uh, it turns out that the number of n color compositions not allowing color too is the same as the number of uh, this sort of compositions with parts uh, congruent to two modulus three. Okay. So this is a very bizarre uh, collection of objects really. Um, and I had no clue how to ever find a bijection between them. Um, so this is all thanks to my collaborator. He had this uh, brilliant idea that I think uh, some of us might find interesting and you might be able to use it somewhere else. It's half open, well, allowing the parts of a composition to be half open, half closed or open on both sides. Uh, so here is an example. Now this is not an example of the bijection or anything, just the example of the kind of half open parts that we're allowing. So we put a dot on the left or the right or on both sides to denote that our part is open on the left or right or on both sides. And then when you put this kind of parts together, um, two adjacent parts, if they are both open at the join, then they are combined. If it's closed on one side or both sides, then it's uh, well, then it's uh, separated. Uh, so basically, if somehow we ended up with this, 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 this together, then they combine into that. So this uh, concept, I'm not even sure if we ever gave it a name, but this kind of items were used in the uh, bijection between these two collections of objects. Uh, and the bijection goes as follows. So we start with a composition with no color two, okay? And uh, for any part of size one, we just map it to a three, but open on the right. Uh, anything not of size one, but with color one, we map it to a triple of parts with a left open two, a two, and uh, something else, and then the remaining stuff. Uh, and then for the third type, which is a part of size at least uh, three, I think, uh, with color at least three. So the thing is that uh, color one is already handled, which means our color has to be at least three because we don't allow color two. So this this could all, uh, really just be k greater than equal to three here. So it, um, so this is the kind of part with color at least three. And uh, we separate it into three parts. Well, we, we map it to three parts, uh, similarly to be above, except that this second part is always going to be larger than two, right? Which is important when we map them back. Uh, and we add a two for technical reason, and we uh, and then we combine them. Okay. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, Without examples, this is impossible to really understand. But if you look at this example and look at this uh, one here, so that gives you a three. And this one here, that gives you that three there, right? Uh, so this ones never stand alone, essentially, in the, uh, in the final result, because the threes they generated are open on the left. Um, 
and uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, and uh, they will always be followed by uh, things like this, which is the left open two, right? And then whatever copies of three uh, will be combined together with that two and give you a part of size uh, two modulus three. Okay. Uh, and then for this two is color one here, it's generated to the, uh, it generates these three parts. And then in the end, you get this. Okay. Um, so this doesn't help that much if you want to understand why is this a bijection. So the inwards goes as follows. Um, yeah, that's quite a lot to read. Um, well, let me just show the example. All right, so basically what happened is that we take the first part, fourth part, uh, seventh part, so on and so forth. So all of these parts until the last part. Uh, the reason is that with parts that are congruent to two modulus three, of uh, of a com of of an integer three and plus two, you are guaranteed to have three times something plus one parts. So, uh, so this is always the last part. Uh, and for each of this, we break it into. Um, into a bunch of threes and a two, okay? So each part is congruent to modulus three. So for example, this eight, right? So it turns into these threes and a two. And then when we uh, map it back, these two threes will map to ones, and that's these two ones here, right? Uh, so for each of these, so for the twos here, of course, they just stay as two, and there are no threes or ones generated, right? And that gives you this two here and this two here. And that five gives you a three and a two. The three gives you that one and this two. Um, so basically this takes care of all these ones um, and, uh, and leaves these twos with two extra parts afterwards, right? So this two together with those two twos are grouped together. Uh, this two together with that five and twos are grouped together, so on and so forth. And each of these little groups of triples of uh, things that start with two are mapped back to one part, depending on whether the second part is two or not. So you already saw that from the uh, original map, um, the only different, the main difference is that whether the second part is two or not, that's X here. Uh, then you can map it to a part with color one or color not one. Okay. So that was more or less the, uh, the bijection. Um, I think it's the, it's quite difficult to understand at first, but it was really interesting because of the use of half open stuff. Uh, also about n color combinations, n color compositions with no color two, there is a direct formula. So again, like all this stuff was just shown there without proof. Um, I don't even know how did people get this before. Some people can keep this guess formula uh, using the computer program and looking at data. Uh, it's a talent that I do not possess. Um, but for us, you know, we want to prove it. And we spotted tiling representation. So what we do is, uh, let's see. We start from, well, we start from this side of the identity. Um, so basically we look at a one by n plus k uh, rectangle where uh, y k. Oh yeah. Uh, so we start with this one by n plus k uh, board and uh, we label the squares, we label Uh, 
All right, sorry, I'm a little confused here. Oh yeah, we label 3K of the squares as, you know, A1, A2, A3K. Okay, so we label them. So on the next page, there is a picture which will make much more sense. But on this board, we label 3K of the squares. Uh, and then for every three consecutive uh, labeled squares, we group them into a tile. And then depending on the middle uh, labeled cell, we, we, we either remove the first cell or the last cell and generate a new part. Okay. So this is impossible to explain without pictures. So let me show the picture. Uh, so that's that. So there is our uh, one by n plus k. I'll explain why n plus k in a second. And basically out of all these little cells, we chose three k of them to be marked by these uh, little circles. Uh, and then basically number one, two, three gives you a part. Number four, five, six gives you another part, so on and so forth, right? And uh, in between this part, if there is some empty spot between three and four, between six and seven, between uh, nine and 10, if there are extra cells, they are all uh, piled with this square with a spot inside. So they are all uh, filled with that. And then for each of these, we're going to turn it into a part uh, corresponding to a tile in the spot tiling representation. And of course, we do not want co uh, color two there, okay? So if the color, so we chose the middle uh, marked cell to be the color, to be the spot. And if it actually happens to be color two, we just chop the head off, right? So we remove that one so that it becomes color one. And if it's not, and if it is not of color two, say like this one, then we chop the tail off and uh, this becomes, well, this is the same color, but the part size is reduced by one. Um, and then we just put them together to get a composition, in color composition with no color two here. So the no color two part is quite easy to understand. Um, and you can also see that we do allow all the other possible colors other than color two because everything else is preserved. Um, and when you think about the inverse of this map, what you want to do is you want to take uh, all this stuff, uh, the one sub ones basically, and keep them as blank cells, right? So eventually they end up there. And then for each part, we generate uh, a tile um, of size one more than it. And that's what this plus, that, that's where this plus K came from, where uh, you either add it to the front if it was of color one, um, or you add it to the end if it's not of color one. And there you have it. And what does this have to do with our direct formula? Because the direct formula was just a summation of something to 3M, right? So this is our 3M there, right? So if you have K parts in your uh, original N color, just kidding. If you have K parts of size bigger than one in the original N color composition, then each of them corresponds to this one of these triplets of marked uh, cells. So you have three times that many. And uh, the size of this board increased by exactly that many because each of these tiles increased by one from here to there, right? So there go n plus k to 3k, where k changes from zero to whatever, gives you the explicit formula of this, okay? Um, right. Uh, another interesting thing that one can observe is that sometimes um, collections of completely different type of objects can be related together. So like here, um, A counts the number of N color compositions with odd colors, and B counts the number of N color compositions where you don't have one, okay? So no part of size one, no one one size. Um, and then the bijection is constructed as you would expect 
from uh, the collection of entire composition with only odd parts to a combination of that, disjoint union of that. Okay. So here's how it's described. Um, so if we start, uh, so if we go backwards, start from uh, compositions where we don't have ones, right? Uh, for all the short ones, the ones of n minus one, you just add a one at the end. And uh, after that, you combine that new collection, which is of uh, length n now, of course, but n with one. Combine that with the original n color compositions with no ones in it. And then all we have to do is to look at every even colored part, right? Because we don't want even colored part in, uh, in, in this collection. So if there is an even colored part, you just chop the head off as a one part and the rest is, well, the, the rest remains the same, but it becomes a part of size one less and color one less. Okay. Uh, so here's the picture. Uh, what we have here, this in this first row here is a N color composition with no part of size one, right? And uh, this is of N minus one. So this belongs to that set right there. And you add a, add a one at the end and that gives you something in this B prime of N. Uh, and then you look in here and you look for everything with even color and that will be this one and that one. So anything with an even color, you chop your head off, make a separate part of size one and the remaining part gives you a part of odd color. Uh, and that's that. So, yeah. So going backwards, um, if you start with n color compositions with uh, odd colors, right? All we have to do, so, so basically it looks like something like this. And then every time you hit a one, you just check if the next one has, uh, well, actually, every time you hit a one, you just combine with the next part. There's no if, I'm sorry. Um, it's been a while since I looked at this. Um, so this one combines with the next one and it gives you a even colored part, right? And that one combines this one. So this way you are guaranteed to get rid of all the part of size one, unless you have one part of size one in the very end, which you drop to get to a composition in that set, right? Um, so yeah, so I guess I went a little faster than I should, but hopefully the ideas are clear. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Wa. Well, if we could all thank our speaker in some way. <laughs> and uh, are there any questions? I have a potentially <laughs> silly question. So when when you had this summation over binomial coefficients where only 3k is down there, have you tried summing with third roots of unices? Does that help at all? Uh, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So here, have you tried to like multiply with third roots of unities, because then every third is real and the other two like cancel. Does it ever come up when you think modulo three? This we approach. Try that. Uh, and thinking about it now, I have no idea what will come up. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there is also this sum. Uh, I see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. Okay. Yeah, but we didn't. We definitely didn't even try, so it's it's interest. It's an interesting idea. I just I don't know what's. Going I on. have seen a formula remotely like this only once in my life, and there it helped help to do some sort of a binomial theorem with third roots of unities, which was it would just pick up every third term. Mm.
Yeah, no. yeah, I don't know because this top number changes. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like one over one minus x kind of things. It's like negative. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I have no answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there other questions for Paul? Uh, if there are, are no other questions, uh, um, thank you again, Hua, for, for an excellent talk. And um, thanks everyone for coming out. So I think we'll go ahead and, and break there. All right. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.